Okay, so hello everyone. My name is István Fajt. Uh, I am one of the members of the Apache Ozone Project Management Committee, and I work for Cloudera. Uh, and I'm here to talk about Apache Ozone, uh, which is a distributed storage system. It's pretty much higher on the stack than everything else that I heard about so far. So I hope you will uh, find something interesting in it. Um, in my talk, I would like to start with a brief project int uh, introduction. Uh, I want to talk about the security features that we have in Apache Ozone, and then I try to go a little bit deeper on uh, tokens and how we use them, what for uh, we use them, and uh, about the public key infrastructure that we have internally uh, in between the services uh, and in our internal communication. Um, pretty much uh, with the project introduction, I would like to also uh, give a bird view of how the architecture is laid out for uh, such a system. Uh, Apache Ozone itself is... Uh, under the Apache Software Foundation, but the main contributors are uh, different companies. Uh, Cloudera was one of, uh, actually Hortonworks was one who started the project, and now it's under Cloudera. Uh, Tencent is another big contributor from like almost the beginning, and uh, the other companies are there uh, in the recent years, uh, have, and uh, yeah, they joined in the recent years, um, mostly uh, as a user uh, who want to contribute to the project. Um, the whole thing started pretty much in 2003, when Google released the uh, file system and map to use papers. After that, duck cutting started to develop Hadoop, and it became a project under Apache in 2006. In 2009, uh, the project was uh, separated into four different sub-projects, and one was HDFS, which is the Hadoop Distributed File System. Basically, that is the predecessor of Ozone, um, and Ozone is basically an answer for scaling problems in HDFS, which became like inevitable uh, or which became clear uh, around 2014-ish uh, when the first discussion have started about how to scale HDFS because HDFS has really hard limits around 400 million uh, file system objects. Uh, that, is the, that is the point where the name node starts to suffer from Java as a memory management, because the whole project is actually written in Java. Uh, <clears throat> there were two distinct answers for the scaling problems at that point in time. One is federation, which is pretty much sharding the metadata space into different name nodes with that uh, alleviating the uh, memory management problems. And the other was Apache Ozone. Uh, at that point, it was called uh, the uh, HDSL, which, uh, which I don't remember what stands for, but it became Ozone uh, at, at a point in time, actually in 2018. Uh, Ozone uses a different approach to solve the uh, problem of the size of the metadata that we need to handle with that amount of objects in the file system. Uh, we actually did uh, groups uh, from individual blocks, and we call these groups as containers. With that, we are elevating the cost of storing data on the data nodes. And um, we also separated the uh, metadata from the actual block location management uh, into two different services. Uh, and with that, we can achieve uh, scaling to over billions of objects. Actually, uh, the biggest test that we have run is around 10 billion objects uh, so far, and it flies. Uh, so. With that, Apache Ozone is trying to be a highly scalable distributed storage system for analytics and big data workloads in a cloud native way. Uh, so we support running in, in Kubernetes containers as well uh, if needed. 
but primarily, the primary use cases are pretty much on-prem use cases. Um, Ozone supports uh, an S3 compatible API and uh, it also supports the Hadoop uh, compatible file system API implementation. And we try to optimize for both efficient, efficient object store and efficient file system operations. Uh, for that, we use different approaches uh, for file system like access and object store like access. Um, the internal file system structure is consisting from uh, of volumes. These are the uh, top level constructs. Inside the volumes we have buckets, which is pretty much similar to S3 buckets. Uh, and a volume defines uh, a separate namespace for these buckets. And inside the buckets we store the keys, which can be, uh, can be viewed as files as well. In object store, sem uh, object store semantics, the volume is basically a group of buckets. Uh, a bucket is a bucket and the key is a key. Uh, and it translates to, uh, the volume translates to a top level directory in a file system view. A bucket is a directory inside the top level directory. And a, a key can be a directory or a file inside uh, a directory in a top level directory. Uh, that's, that's how it translates to to file system view. Sure. Why didn't you just put object in the bucket Sorry? For the object, why didn't you do it the visit the store? Instead of a bucket, you do a bucket and key, you do a bucket, prefix, and a key. The key can have a prefix. So so the question is why we uh, not you why we just not use buckets and then prefix key uh, to identify a key in an object store semantic. Yeah. So this prefix and then so separate the bucket is That was pretty much a decision uh, before I came to the project. <laughs> uh, but what I can tell about it, uh, volume is just another layer of abstraction uh, because uh, the original design uh, considered uh, a company that wants to use an object store. And inside the company, uh, we, we thought that there are different organizations like finance, like uh, development and things like that. So they can have their own volumes and within the volume they can have their own buckets. With that there are no name uh, collision in between the buckets. Okay, so inside the volume you can have, between two volumes you can have buckets with the same name? Yes. Oh, okay, so it's like a name. Yes, so, so yeah, volume is a namespace uh, for buckets, yes. All right. Uh, so how we communicate with an ozone cluster? Uh, the ozone cluster consists a lot of nodes. There are uh, different uh, roles, so let's see what we have. First we have the client layer, uh, which is completely different, so you don't access ozone uh, as a file system on your local machine. You use uh, CLI tools or, or the Java API to connect to the cluster and read or write data. Uh, we support a command line client, a file system API, which is uh, in Java, uh, an S3 gateway, which you can uh, reach with the general S3 uh, tools. And we also have an HTTPFS gateway, which is basically giving the similar API as the HDFS, HTTPFS gateway. We inherited that from the HDFS project. All these things are talking to a native RPC client, which will translate all the requests to the uh, Ozone server side. The client itself will talk to the metadata layer. Uh, and inside the metadata layer, we have Ozone managers. I have three because uh, we have uh, an HA setup, uh, or we support high available uh, setups. Um, it was not, yeah, uh, it was not that uh, from the beginning, but, uh, but currently the uh, architecture is a highly available uh, co considering management nodes, and the Ozone Manager is one of them. And we have the HDDS storage layer, which consists of the storage container managers and the data nodes themselves. Uh, the storage container manager is responsible to 
keep track of what data nodes we have, uh, how much resource we have per data node, and things like that. <clears throat> the client itself is communicating with only the Ozone Manager, and it does metadata operations with the Ozone Manager. Everything that affects the uh, actual data storage and block placement is communicated with the storage container manager. So uh, for those, Ozone Manager just turns to the storage container manager and gets back data like where to store some blocks or uh, where to find some blocks. And the client then goes to the uh, data nodes directly to transfer data in or out the cluster. And we have Ozone Recon. Uh, which is pretty much a monitoring system uh, that checks uh, certain aspects of the system and uh, reports it in a web UI. Uh, and pretty much that's, that these are the components we have within Ozone. High availability itself is uh, pretty much done uh, with the help of Rafter application in which we have a leader and two followers. Uh, this is pretty much an active standby replication uh, within the nodes. And uh, similarly, between storage container managers, we have uh, a raft consensus algorithm running, or raft ring running. Uh, and in between data nodes for data replication, we also use raft. All right, let's talk about security. Security uh, itself covers a couple of things like authentication, authorization, at rest encryption, and uh, over the wire encryption as well. Uh, let's start with authentication. <clears throat> For authentication, we use different things. So when clients are wanting to communicate uh, with the system, they use different type of authentication mechanisms. The file system API and the Ozone command line interface uses Kerberos or delegation tokens. Uh, the S3 gateway uses the usual secret key and access key that is used in S3. And the HTTPFS gateway uses Kerberos with SPNAGO, uh, so Kerberos over HTTP, basically. Uh, these are uh, the, the actual principles uh, that needs to be authenticated are communicated to the native RPC client uh, in process. So there we don't need anything else. Uh, and then Hadoop RPC helps us to transfer these principles to the system. So Ozone Manager will get that via the Hadoop RPC uh, mechanism. Uh, and internally, Ozone manager and Managers and Storage Container Managers are also using Kerberos to authenticate themselves to each other uh, and ver verify the other side's authent uh, authenticity. Uh, and uh, in the communication with the data nodes, we use tokens. Uh, tokens are consisting uh, of different kind of data. Uh, basically, they are uh, identifying the client and uh, uh, giving information about what the client is authorized to do. Uh, so basically, these are used for, uh, for authenticating the clients and then authorizing the clients as well. And Ozone Recon itself is using SPNAGO to authenticate any clients that are wanting to see what is happening on the cluster. Usually these are the cluster administrators. All right, let's talk about authorization. Uh, in authorization, the Ozone Manager is the only thing that is being used uh, or has a role. Uh, it gets the client's principle uh, pretty much via the uh, RPCs. And internally, it has an interface defined called IXS Authorizer. Uh, and we have three different implementation for uh, doing authorization. Uh, one is the Ozone Access Authorizer, which is basically just a dummy implementation. It allows anything, basically. Uh, this is used in unsecure environments where security is enforced by uh, other uh, tools like firewalls and other policy rules. Um, we have Ozone Native Authorizer, which is an inbuilt uh, authorization system. Uh, it is 
pretty much a superset of what uh, authorization is available in S3 and in a POSIX system. Uh, and yeah, we implemented those parts that are have any meaning within Ozone. And we also have a Ranger Ozone Authorizer, which basically delegates the authorization to Apache Ranger. Um, Apache Ranger gives us uh, a more fine-grained fine control of what is accessible to whom in the system based on roles, groups, and everything else. And pretty much that's it. So uh, once a user is authenticated and authorized to do something, then uh, the system does what the user asks him to do. Um, with that, I want to talk, uh, turn to. Before you go on, yep. can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. So, I think you may have to build it out, but if I remember correctly, there's a connection between the ozone native RTC clients and the ozone data nodes. Let's see. Is there any connection between the ozone manager and the ozone data nodes? No. There's no. There is no connection between so the ozone manager and the how does authorization prevent an ozone native RPC client from doing something that it shouldn't the uh, The authorization itself happens in the ozone manager. So if the if if, if 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 the query uh, that the user does, so for example, if if a user uh, if a client wants to access a block, uh -huh. uh, it goes to the ozone manager and asks for the block location, yeah. uh, and ozone manager just uh, reject uh, this query. So the client does not know where to go in the data nodes. So, what if they just, so, but they do have something they can access. And so they say they want to access that. Like maybe, can they guess the location? Yeah. Uh, I, I've never done that before. <laughs> yes, they, they can try to guess the location, but in that case, um, the data node will reject because. Uh, in order to, so in a secure environment, in a properly set up secure environment, uh, if a client wants to access something on the data node, it has to prov uh, provide a token. A token, ha uh, I will talk about that, but it has a signature from the ozone manager or from the storage container manager, and that signature is verified. So the, the, so the data node can reject the request. Yes. Okay, so the ozone manager will embed the Authorized action into the token that's given to the token. Yes. Okay, got it. Thanks. Sure. Okay, where were we? Encryption at rest. Uh, all right. Uh, so there is a need um, by our users to be sure that the data cannot be read by unauthor unauthorized personnel. So uh, they want to encrypt, uh, want to store the data encrypted without the administrators have any access to the data uh, in some cases. This is, uh, this is usually happening because of regulatory reasons or internal security requirements. In this case, uh, we uh, have uh, the uh, facilities to enable encryption at rest, which is pretty much client driven. Uh, so the system does not know about the actual encryption keys that are used to uh, encrypt the data. For, for this, we use a key management server, which can be basically anything. And I think I was really wrong about selecting 30% opacity, but in the background there is a hardware security module that can connect to the key management server uh, if, if someone needs it. Um, but that is not really important because in that case uh, what happens is just that the key management server asks the keys or, or stores the keys in the security module, uh, but the flow from the client's perspective is the same. Uh, so what happens if we want to write encrypted? First, we need an ozone administrator uh, who will uh, go to the key management server 
and we create a master encryption key. This encryption key is created within the key management server and never returned to the administrator. Uh, and internally, it is used to generate data encryption keys. Uh, then the administrator goes to the Ozone Manager and creates a bucket because our uh, unit of encryption is the bucket. Uh, and it creates the bucket with the encryption key set. Uh, the encryption key, uh, the end key string there is the name of the key uh, that we can refer uh, the actual key with. Uh, and after that, the administrator's work is done. Uh, we have a bucket which will store the data in an encrypted way. And then a client comes. Uh, it wants to put a key to the encrypted uh, space. Uh, and <clears throat> um, sorry, um, so it issues a put key request. The put key request, when it hits the ozone manager, uh, can uh, lead to two things. One is that the, uh, the response is given right away because we have pre-cached data encryption keys, or optionally the ozone manager needs to go to the key management server and generate some data encryption keys that it can return to the client. These data encryption keys are uh, transferred to the ozone manager in an encrypted way. It is encrypted with the master key within the key management server. And once the client has the encrypted data encryption key, it can go to the key management server to decrypt it. And uh, after that, it can encrypt the data and store the, da store the encrypted data on the data nodes into the given locations. Um, during this process, the client is authorized uh, to uh, access the encryption key or, 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 or actually to decrypt the data encryption key. Uh, and if it, can, if it is not allowed to decrypt the encrypted data encryption key, then uh, it is not allowed to encrypt and the client will fail. Uh, after the encrypted data is sent to the data node, uh, the client itself goes back to the ozone manager and uh, issues a commit key request, which basically says to the ozone manager that, okay, I am finished the write and everything is done uh, on my end. Uh, pretty much that's it uh, for writes. And when, one, when the client wants to read the data back, then, uh, <coughs> Again, it goes to the ozone manager to get the key. It gets back the key data in which there is the encrypted data encryption key. The client go, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and then the client goes to the key management server to decrypt the encrypted data encryption key. With that, it can decrypt the data when it reads from the data nodes. And uh, yeah, it can use it for whatever it pleases. Pretty much that's it. So uh, this is how we implemented encryption at rest. Um, it's, it's pretty much following the model that is already there in HDFS. Uh, nothing novel, uh, but, but yeah, this is, this, is, this is the internal flows within Ozone. All right, uh, let's get deeper a little bit into tokens. Uh, what is a token, how it is used, how it is secured, uh, what kind of tokens we have, which service issues these tokens and things like that. And uh, after that, uh, I'm gonna introduce a recent change because we learned that our uh, previous implementation is like really, really slow and dominated by the signature algorithm that we have chosen. So let's see what Ask people sure. about the encryption. So the encryption is not on the client, is that correct? It's not only? The encryption is, is it the client that does the encryption? I'm sorry, I don't get the first word. Is it? <laughs> is it the client who does the encryption? Ah, yes, the client does the right. encryption, yes. And the second question, is the data encryption key unique for like data? For uh, there is a master key 
per bucket uh, because yeah, we encrypt a bucket. And within that, every key or every file, whichever you look, uh, is having a different encrypted data encryption key stored with the metadata together. So the Ozone Manager stores the encrypted data encryption key and the decryption can happen in the key management server with the master key. Okay, so what is a token? What, what is inside the token? Uh, inside the token we have a token identifier, a password, uh, a kind, uh, a service, and a renewer. The token identifier is uh, the thing that we uh, translate into a byte array and sign uh, with the digital signature algorithm. That will, uh, that will become the password. The kind defines the type of the token. Uh, the service defines which service has issued the token. And the renewer is uh, a client side thing which defines uh, the client that is uh, uh, enabled to renew the token. Because the token by default valid for one day. And uh, um, it can be renewed for seven days. Inside the token identifier, we also have the kind stored. Uh, we have the user who uh, has the token. We have a tracking ID. And we have a couple of implementation dependent information like authorization information uh, for certain type of tokens uh, or, or anything as a host. Uh, hosts that uh, have the, the, the token, hosts that have the token issued, or or things like that. Um, it it is basically different from token kind to token kind to token kind. Uh, all of this is basically considered as the token material, and we have three different secret managers. One is the block token secret manager. Uh, every secret, secret manager, when it gets a token material, it, it signs the token based on the token identifier. It generates that byte array, generates the signature for that byte array, so we, we can verify on the other end that the token was not uh, modified. Um, we have the delegation token secret manager, which deals with delegation tokens, and we have the container token secret manager. These are, these are three different kind of tokens uh, that we deal with. Uh, two of them, the blocks and uh, block tokens and the delegation tokens are managed by the ozone manager. Uh, the container token is managed by the storage container manager. And let's see them in communication. A uh, delegation token is used by distributed jobs. In a distributed job, you have a driver code uh, which will uh, start up a, uh, a good couple of uh, workers, and it will get a delegation token from the ozone manager. That delegation token is uh, given to the worker nodes. With that, the worker nodes can authenticate as the uh, user behind the drive, uh, who is running the driver code. Uh, the driver itself can get, renew, and cancel a delegation token. And pretty much that's, that's what we use it for. So every worker behind the uh, distributed job uses these delegation tokens when they talk to Ozone Manager or talk to the Ozone Data Nodes. Uh, and the simple Ozone client, when it tries to access a key, it does not use a delegation token because it will be just one request usually or multiple requests, but uh, those requests will uh, have a different token for every request. Uh, when, the, when a client tries to access a key, uh, it goes to the Ozone Manager. The Ozone Manager goes to the storage container manager to acquire container information. Container is storing the blocks for certain files. Uh, with that, uh, when the container, uh, when the storage container manager re returns the container information, it also, also issues a container token uh, in case the client needs to do some container operations, like opening a new container uh, if the previous container is full during the write. Uh, and then the Ozone Manager returns the container token and also issues a block token 
for block level authorization uh, inside the data node. And then the client can go to the data nodes and uh, send the data and also the tokens to, uh, to authenticate itself and have the proper rights. Then the token verif verification happens in the data node side and with that, uh, the data can be written if everything is okay. Um, I mentioned that, that we recently changed the algorithm that we use for signing. Uh, we achieved a two order of magnitude speed up in that and yeah, actually 100 times faster because uh, we used, uh, uh, we switched to an asymmetric key signature, uh, sorry, we had an asymmetric key signature, uh, and that is expensive as it turned out. We used uh, 2048-bit RSA key uh, to sign the data, and uh, that, was also, that key was also used in our internal public key infrastructure, but the RSA, uh, the RSA signature itself denominated all the R uh, RPC calls, like 80% of the runtime was uh, spent with the signature itself in those cases. So we introduced symmetric uh, encryption in, instead. Uh, and with that, the signature generation was down from the, one, the milliseconds range to the microseconds range, uh, which is yeah, pretty much a significant speed up. Uh, but symmetric key encryption has a problem you need to distribute a shared secret key in between the participants somehow, or you need to use a, um, an algorithm like Diffie-Hellman to get to a consensus key uh, that is being used without sharing keys. Uh, we chose to share keys because internally in a secure setup we have TLS communication between uh, the parties that are requiring to deal with these signatures, um, and that's, that's what I'm going to show. So these are the parties. Uh, let's re rearrange this a little bit. Uh, so we have the storage container managers. The storage container managers are managing the PKI system, so they were uh, a natural choice to manage the symmetric encryption keys as well. Uh, what we have there is uh, a leader and two followers in the raft. So we chose the leader, uh, or we nominated the leader, to generate the uh, key that we will use, the shared secret. And once that is generated, uh, every, everyone else, uh, it is being shared between the, st uh, the storage container managers, and everyone else can reach out to the storage container manager uh, to get the uh, the symmetry uh, the secret key. Uh, whenever a request arrives to either an ozone manager or a data node, either uh, either it has the key, or uh, and and it can issue a token without any further ado, or it does not have the key, uh, the actual key that is valid, and it acquires the key and then issues the token. Similarly, the data nodes do the same for verification. And well, uh, and with that, uh, basically, every everyone has the, their secret, uh, the shared secret key. Uh, inside the leader and inside every other service, we have a circular structure that is storing seven keys. These keys are generated uh, daily by default. Um, so every day we have a new key. Once we reach seven, uh, the new key, uh, key seven, is being uh, generated in f and replaces the, the first key. Um, with that, uh, what we achieved is the, the easiness of uh, expiring keys after the seven day interval until they are uh, available. Uh, and yeah, this, this seven day interval seems to be a good trade off uh, with, uh, compromise, uh, with compromised keys as well because they are pretty much uh, going uh, or phasing out quickly. 
Uh, at the moment, we don't have a mechanism to revoke a, a, a specific key that is being used. Uh, but yeah, if there is a need, then then probably we will have. Um, so if, if a key currently is compromised, then it is still used in the system un up until seven days. All right, roughly that's about tokens. Uh, and I pretty much don't really have too much time. Uh, but let's, let's discuss quickly about our public key infrastructure. Um, so here is the architecture dia diagram. Client side is not really important, so I just put that aside and uh, a little bit rearranged to show how the bootstrap will happen. Uh, as I already mentioned, storage container managers are the one who are uh, are the ones who are responsible for for holding the root of trust and. Uh, for that and to bootstrap the whole system, uh, we need a primordial node, uh, which is basically a, spec uh, a specific node uh, that does the uh, root CS uh, that generates the root CS certificate for us, uh, which will be the root of trust within the system. Uh, when it is generated, it starts up a root CS server. Um, we uh, with, with the root CS server, we uh, expose an API to get certificates. This API uses Kerberos uh, in the backend uh, to authenticate any request, and uh, we restrict the API to be available to just the system components we have. So you cannot just go to this interface and talk to it with a general principle. You have to have uh, the one of the principles of the data nodes or the OSA manager or recon. Um, in the bootstrap, uh, once we have the root CS server, this primordial node also initializes a sub CS server. Uh, so we will have a second layer of CS certificates uh, under the root CA. Uh, and actually we will forget about the root CA at all for the general operations. This sub CS server will be used to sign all the other certificates that are being signed during the bootstrap. Uh, and first and foremost, the other two, uh, actually the sub CS server will issue a, a certificate sign request and get the certificate from the root CS server. Uh, and then the node starts. The other storage container managers are bootstrapping at that point, and uh, they are also starting a sub CS server and issuing a certificate sign request to the root CS server. Uh, with that, they get the certificate, and after that, we forget the root CS server. In the sub CS server, we allow Ozone managers, data nodes, and recon to connect, and also other storage container managers in case you need to replace one. Um, and uh, where am I? Yeah. Uh, and when the other services start up for the first time in the cluster, uh, they start a certificate client. This client will issue a certificate sign request to the actual storage container manager leader, get their certificates back, and store the, those, their certificates and the root CS certificate. Now the client comes into the picture because the data nodes themselves also use TLS to encrypt the data transfer from the client to the data node. Uh, they are, uh, so the clients have to trust the data nodes. Uh, and as the clients are only speaking to the ozone manager, uh, during the, uh, uh, the request, bootstrap phase, there is a call uh, called get service info, which provides some information about the service itself and also returns the root CA certificate to the client. So the client knows uh, what certificates it can trust. And when the client goes to the data nodes, uh, the trust is based on the root CA certificate because yeah, everything inherits the trust from the, the initial root CS certificate that we had. All right. Uh, 
Let's see. Uh, we use MTLS internally. So in the client, we cannot use MTLS because there is uh, there can be a, a time when like thousands of clients are hitting the Ozone Manager, uh, and we cannot issue uh, a certificate to any every client. So in the client side, we chose not to use Mutual TLS, but the client itself, when it talks to the Ozone Manager. It authenticates with Kerberos. When it talks to the data node, it is authenticated and authorized based on the tokens. Uh, but the client has to know that it can trust the data node, so it, it has to check the data node's certificate. Um, internally, uh, the services are talking with each other uh, with the mutual TLS-enabled uh, channel. Uh, so the rafting and any other internal communication goes through uh, channels that are in, uh, that are secured with MTLS. All right, let's see what the certificate client does because it has a, a couple of uh, responsibilities. First of first of which is the creation of key material, storing it. Uh, actually, it stores locally on the host at the moment in a folder that is available for only the process, uh, user of the process uh, which is running the actual service. And it also stores the certificate and the root CS certificate. It is responsible to rotate the certificate uh, upon expiration. Um, we have the grace period defined, it is 20, 10, 28 days by default. So the certificate is renewed 28 days prior to uh, the expiration, or at least it is being tried to be renewed and then we retry if it fails. It's also responsible to download and store the root CS certificate. Uh, so we have the root of trust uh, internally and we can verify others' certificates. Uh, it is also responsible to refresh the root CS certificate. So uh, we do rotation of the root CS certificate upon its exp uh, when it expires. Uh, so the clients needs to get that information or get notified about that the, the root CA is changing. Um, it provides the TLS, uh, TLS set of information for any channels or any connections that we use. It initializes and refreshes, for this, it initializes and refreshes as it needs to refresh uh, a, a custom Java key store and the trust store as well. And yeah, rotating the root certificate is something which is tricky. Um, because you need to have uh, an established trust at every point in time uh, when the cluster is running, and we implemented it, uh, and we are implementing it to be destructionless to change a certificate within a service. Uh, this feature is not complete yet. Uh, there are two, three small things that is missing, but once it's ready, we will release it in the. Uh, upstream community first, and then it will come into a cloud that release as well. Uh, most of the things are already done, and we know how we will do it. The first step is that the actual leader uh, from the storage container managers is creating a new root CA certificate. The root CA certificate is basically a self-signed certificate which we have to create with the key material. After that, uh, we notify uh, the other storage container managers that, okay, we started to rotate the root CS certificate, and they need to act because they need to uh, create their own new sub-CA certificates. So they are creating a new certificate, uh, new key, new certificate sign request, sending back the certificate sign request, the leader signs it, sends back the certificate. Uh, it does it internally with its sub-CA server as well. Um, and after that, uh, we have two set of certificates uh, in the system, uh, the old one and the new one. As a four steps, the followers act the root CA rotation, and if all the followers have sent the act back to the leader, that is the point when the leader commits and says that, okay, root CAs are rotated, root CA is rotated, we have all the new sub CA certificates. This point, the new root CA certificate is made available to any other uh, party in the system. Uh, and uh, they, have, uh, uh, the, they have the certificate client. Within the certificate client, we have a polling mechanism 
uh, that starts to uh, pull the, for the new root CS certificate when it's time. Uh, we can calculate it based on the actual root CA's expiration date. Uh, and uh, we start the pulling. With, uh, once, we, uh, once we did the pulling, um, the different uh, services are, uh, are hit the storage container manager at a different point in time. So we will have to wait. We have a, a pull frequency and we do not sign any new certificates for any other components until everyone at least once uh, hit the polling interval. Uh, so we wait uh, for the rest of the system to, not, uh, to, to recognize that there is a new root CA. Once uh, we are through that, then the ozone manager first starts to serve both the old and the new root CS certificates to the clients, because that is that is crucial. At that point, all the services are already know about the, uh, both root CS certificates that we have, uh, but the clients will uh, at that point uh, will get both, uh, or or from that point will get both. And as an eighth step, every uh, uh, every other service component uh, outside the storage container managers are renewing their certificates at a certain time. But uh, from then on, we have uh, both root CS certificates. So we have both root of trusts distributed within the system and to the clients. Uh, so everyone can renew their certificate with the new root CA. Uh, and that, and with that, the trust is uh, basically uh, remain established for the whole uh, procedure. That's that's how we did that. Did that. Um, the, uh, the one remaining step basically is uh, the handling of the this thing in the client because that has some problems. Even though a new client can get two root CS certificate, if there is a long running client uh, which has only one. Uh, the old, uh, that that client will fail at some point in time, and we need to handle that failure carefully uh, and get the new root CA certificate to the client in order to uh, re-establish trust. Um, pretty much that's it about uh, the current features and the recent changes. Uh, this, this root CA, rot uh, this certificate rotation itself is fairly new, so we are developing this in the last year, roughly. Um, before that, uh, to, to reboot strap the whole cluster, you had to stop down everything, uh, clear some directories and restart the whole cluster with, with cleared uh, metadata information, which is pretty much tedious, so uh, this feature, uh, or these features are to alleviate that. And what the future holds uh, is, is a good question. Uh, we miss certificate revocation completely from this picture. Uh, for that, if, if just one certificate is compromised, then you can uh, basically uh, stop that service, remove the old certificate and start the service, it will, it will get a new one. Uh, if the root CA or any C, uh, sub CAs are compromised, then you still need to do the full bootstrap uh, again. Uh, so for that, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's a problem, uh, but uh, yeah, we are planning to do revocation. Uh, which will uh, automatically kick off any uh, any operations that needs to be done. So, for example, if the if the some of the CAs are compromised, then we will need to redo all the certificates, but without service disruption. Uh, that's the plan with revocation. Um, we also miss uh, documentation. <laughs> we are developers, and we don't like to document <laughs> but uh, yeah we will uh, we will need to do that and we will need a prescriptive documentation how, on how to do a secure setup in ozone uh, there are some information already available but it's not really clear what needs to be done in order to ensure end-to-end uh, -end security we also need 
uh, at some point in time a pluggable mechanism uh, to store the keys and the certificates for the hosts. Because at the moment we are stored in the local file system. For administrators it is, ac uh, uh, it is accessible, with the root exploit it is, it is accessible so it's easy to compromise. The only thing that we could do to alleviate it somewhat is to forget about the root CA keys uh, once we finish the bootstrap. Uh, other than that, uh, yeah, we, we, need to, uh, we need to implement some mechanisms to store these keys in a secure place like in, a, in an HSM or, or similar if someone needs it. Uh, we need simple tools to ensure the right to be forgotten. We, we have something in Ozone called a GDPR compliant block bucket, but it is tedious to use. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the problem, but in a distributed storage system, if you delete something, the metadata can be deleted easily, but the actual data deletion happens eventually at some point in time after the deletion. And uh, the GDPR constraints are not really allowing this. Uh, and what we figured out uh, we can do is to use an ozone manager generated encryption key, pair it with the metadata, encrypt the data, uh, piggybacking on the encryption and trust architecture or, or communication, uh, encrypt the data and store it in an encrypted way. So we can ensure once the metadata is deleted, the data is not accessible anymore, even though it is not deleted. But that is on, on the bucket level. Uh, and for, uh, for uh, using it uh, in a GDPR compliance way, this means that you need to have a bucket per uh, user uh, or user data, which is not really feasible. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we need some something better. And uh, yes. You have five minutes over. Already? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I haven't seen the sign so far, but. <laughs> okay, uh, anyway, uh, the last thing, security implications of stretching over multiple data, data centers is something that we need to think about, and roughly that's it. Uh, if you have any more questions, I will be available around, uh, and I will be around, and thank you for your attention.